I would like to welcome everyone to the Ancestral Food Podcast. My name is Samuel Anglin, and I will be your host. In this podcast, we will cover an exciting and passionate Native American chef, and his name is Sean Sherman. I will go over his past experiences that have influenced who he is today, and will describe his take on true Native American cuisine. Sean is a proud member of the Agola Lakota Sioux Tribe, and was born on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. He is 42 years old. He has embarked on a journey almost a decade ago to revitalize the gastronomy of his culture and to bring Native American cuisine to more tables. He started working in restaurants at the age of 13 in the Black Hills of South Dakota. He moved to Minneapolis and worked his way up to chef. Some of the cuisine he studied was Spanish, Japanese, and French. He started a catering business in the Twin Cities in 2014 named The Sous Chef. He currently has a Kickstarter program to help build a freestanding building that would house a test kitchen to work on uh, various recipes and special dinners. Chef Sean has 2,358 pledgers. They have pledged more than 148,000 $728. He has a website which I suggest to go visit, The Sous Chef, and he even has started a non-profit organization, North American Traditional Indigenous Food Systems. Sherman has said, Our foods are our culture identifier. It is who we are. We think about the food our grandparents and our great-grandparents ate, and those foods are special to us. However, For many Native American people, there has been so much death, trauma, and oppression that the food systems have taken such a gigantic hit. Back when I started researching Native cuisine, there was no Joy of Native American Cooking cookbook for me to reference, so I had to research these areas myself. A close partner of his once described Sean's passion for his food is is his pride. He takes such pride in his food. His good friend once said. In 2002, he had an epiphany while staying in a town on the Mexico Pacific Coast state of Nariet. While he was there, he interacted with the Huchul Indians. Sherman said, I realized I should focus on foods of my own culture heritage, and that's when I realized the status of where Native American food was back then and what the future could look like. Some of Sherman's menus have featured dishes such as maple and cedar stewed bison with native corn and hominy, seared smoked walleye with black bean puree, fried sunchokes and a syrup produced from the sumac shrub, and rose hip, which is the fruit of the rose plant, a salad of wild greens with stewed sumac and sun-dried rabbit, cedar stewed rabbit with fiddlehead ferns, Roasted duck with blueberry and rosehip sauce, corn, and honey sorbet for the sweet taste buds. He particularly likes to use cedar and use it to venison. Pretty simple recipe. It's just cedar, water, and venison. Cedar wood chips and the cedar greens is what he uses. If cedar is unavailable, he, he will use balsam fir. He tends to use a lot of seeds and nut and oil in his cooking. He makes his own lard from bison and saves all the fat from geese and ducks that he butchers. He has delved into wild plant identification and usage. Ethnobotany, and that is the science of the relationship between people and plants. He was looking at what the Native Americans ate up to the 1800s. Long before the words gluten-free or sustainable were introduced, Native Americans were living a sustainable farm-to-table existence. His menus do not include fry bread, which he sees as an oppression food, and I agree. 
The fry bread was born out of necessity in the 1800s from the government food ration program when the government removed the American Indians off their land and gave them rations of flour, salt, and lard. He has spent much of his culinary career piecing together how his ancestors ate before they were colonized. People these days are talking more about their grandmother's fry bread recipe than they are about a cool sauce that they can make from wild greens or roots. I had a chance on February 26th to sit down and ask Chef Sean Sherman a few questions. He was at the Zibowing Center um, doing a lecture on his book, The Sous Chef. So it was really a great pleasure to sit down and ask him a few questions. So here it is. So sit back and enjoy. So hello, this is the sit down portion of my podcast with Sean Sherman and I'm going to ask him five questions. So Sean, what would you tell future Native American chefs about the importance of our ancestral food? Well, I would say it's really just about getting it back out there. You know, it's researching if uh, your area had agriculture and uh, trying to see if there's any of those seeds left available to celebrate those and to get those back into the ground um, and back there onto the plates eventually. Taking the time to really learn the plants that grow well in your region, um, really getting to know your histories, um, and really just trying to decolonize your thought process as you move forward, um, kind of in the culinary degree. All right. And what would you say is your go-to comfort food? <laughs> That's a tough one. Um, I would say, you know, f- comfort food is... All right, I'm gonna, I know you're going to chop this a little bit. Sure. Okay. Um, so my go-to comfort food, that's a tough one. It's probably tacos. You know, uh, there's a lot of great taco shops sure. around Minneapolis, and I go to Mexico a lot, and uh, I love tacos. Yes. Hey, right, cool. What has been one of your favorite memories working in this business? Uh, just getting to travel so much. I think um, maybe the event I did in India, it was in Shillong, India. Um, where there was an indigenous Terra Madra, it was the conference, and uh, there was 600 people from indigenous groups all across the world, um, and it was just really um, a lot of uh, fun and a lot of learning to be able to talk to and meet people from all over the place, you know, um, that are sharing this passion of rejuvenating, reclaiming, revitalizing indigenous knowledge and uh, um, their culture, and especially the ones that were doing it through food like we were. Oh, that was totally, totally <laughs> cool there. What insights do you have for people who want to open and operate a food truck or a catering business centered around ancestral foods, stuff like that? Yeah, the you know, so those are, of course, uh, tricky businesses, but important businesses because we need a lot more indigenous food businesses out there. And it's really just taking time to, of course, understand the numbers because since you're doing a business, you have to be really careful with the money that's coming in and out, and it takes a lot of planning. Um, I think it's really careful to resource uh, where, where, you're, where you're bringing in your foods from, so where you're resourcing your foods. Um, we always try to support indigenous growers and pr- uh, food producers as much as possible um, and really making that a part of what the mission was. But there's a lot of opportunity out there for people to get into the realm of uh, making uh, indigenous food businesses, um, and there could be a lot of success. But you know, just knowing that food businesses are a tough business, anyways, and just being prepared to do a lot of hard work for it. So, all right. And the last question: What one recipe would you say surprised even you in being both delicious? Yet simple in all your research of your cookbook. I think, you know, once we stopped trying to replicate um, French technique and things like that, and we really realized how beautiful and simple the food was with just a couple ingredients usually, um, that that was surprising because uh, in the beginning we were trying to make. Um, like say cornbread or something and we're trying to use European style recipes we're trying to do this balance of fat and flour and um, and all that and then we had realized some of these pieces were just as simple as like grinding up the food after it's cooked and making a simple like dough out of it and then baking it you know so or like the sunflower cookies Um, So sunflower and maple or maybe honey to sweeten it a touch, and those are the only two ingredients, you know. That's it. So (laughs) just grinding them up and, you know, make a cookie out of just sunflower. Simple but good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, I appreciate your time, Sean. Yeah. And uh, we, uh, uh, the tribe itself appreciates it, and I hope to maybe further uh, 
get out there and visit you in Minneapolis and check out that restaurant. Uh, I'm quite the foodie. Great. And uh, I appreciate your time. Great. Thank you. Now, wow, that was a great interview. Um, it was really appreciative of Chef Sean to sit down and talk to me. Um, it was very, very cool. Uh, so the next topic of my podcast uh, I'd like to delve into is in regards to the Cherokee Nation and their seed bank program that prever- preserves their ancestral foods. It is quite amazing to me that the Cherokee have established a seed bank program that lets each tribal member receive two packets of heirloom seeds that are traditional to their food sustainability program. For Cherokee Nation citizens, it is a way to perpetuate crops that Cherokee people have relied on for generations. This program was established in 2006 and distributes about 2,000 to 5,000 seed packets per year. In 2017, they distributed a record-breaking 3,785 seed packets. This program is managed by Senior Director of Environmental Resources, Pat Gwynn. He has stated, Historically, our people have always been exceptional agriculturalists, and our ancestors farmed these crops for hundreds of years. It connects who we are today as Cherokee people to our rich history. It is something we can share with our kids and grandkids and promotes healthy food consumption and physical activity. Anything we can do to encourage a new generation of Cherokee to connect with their tribal heritage is worth pursuing. To qualify for this program, a person must possess a Cherokee Nation Tribal Citizenship Card as well as proof of age and address. Each applicant is limited to two varieties of seeds. The seed varieties they offer are as follows. For corn, it's Cherokee flour, which is a large flour corn, um, multicolored, uh, then they have white and yellow. For beans, they have the Cherokee Long Greasy, Turkey Gizzard Black, Turkey Gizzard Brown. For squashes, they have Georgia Candy Rooster, a long string squash, a long storing squash that can be prepared as squash or in the regards like sweet potatoes or pumpkin. For gourds, they have Basket, Dipper, Jewel, Buffalo Gourds, Trail of Tear Beads, Indian corn beads. For tobacco, they just have a naco, uh, na- native tobacco strain that's indigenous to their area. Uh, native plants, they have button bush, cut leaf cone flower, hearts of bustin', jewelweed, New Jersey tea, possum grape, purple cauliflower, rattlesnake master, river cane, sunchoke, and wild senna. Well, this concludes my uh, podcast, and um, it is really, really cool to see what the Cherokee Nation are doing to preserve their ancestral foods, and it's also really cool to see what Chef Sean Herman Sherman is doing to promote and to educate people on ancestral foods, because it is quite important, because if we don't teach our next generation things of the past, they will be forgotten. And in my in my words, then I say they have won. Um, so again, this concludes my podcast, and hopefully you have learned a little bit about an influential chef and a great program to pr- promote ancestral food um, and traditional varieties of seeds. So take the time, go to um, the Sous Chef website. Uh, take a look at all of the stuff on that website and at the not non for profit organization that Chef uh, Sherman has set up. Um, Also go to the Cherokee Nation website and uh, under one of their tabs they have uh, a lot of information about this program here. Um, So again, uh, thank you. And uh, we are going to um, close this program out with the travel song. Take care and miigwech for your time.